is an index uh, with the basis 100 in 1999. If in 1999 the products had a price of 100 euros, in 2009-10 when the crisis broke out, you see the, the products had a price of 135 in Italy, even more in Greece, and uh, 107 in Germany. And in France, the country, the only country that really uh, adhered to the, to the inflation target that was set by the ECB, even there the prices would have been much higher than in Germany. So what happens if in one country the prices are high and the other countries are low? Well, it's very simple. People start buying countries, uh, buying goods from the country that has uh, lower prices, and that is Germany. Germany has a competitive advantage of something like 20% over its partners. And that means, and uh, that was the chart we have seen already. I have to go back a bit. I hope it works. I don't know where to put my thing. <laughs> yeah, it takes a moment, but now it's over. Yeah, this one. You see, that means Germany built up a huge current account surplus, a huge current account surplus, and the other countries went slowly uh, into deficit. This is only the US and UK, but for the rest of Europe is also true. Most of the countries went into a deficit. That is to say, the German advantage was not an advantage that was produced by the neoclassical idea of real wages lagging behind productivity, but it was an advantage that was created by the, let me say, primitive, simple idea of mercantilism, which says if you are cheaper than your neighbor, you can beggar your neighbor, you can export your unemployment, so to say, and you can gain at the expense of your partners. And this is a big difference, you see, because this shows it is not, it is not the, um, the nexus, the channel, uh, the neoclassical channel that worked in Germany, but it was this mercantilist channel that worked in Germany and produced uh, the, the advantage that Germany uh, now has against the other countries. And this has some, some dramatic uh, implications that I want to show you at the, at the end of my lecture. You see, if we, if we look at the world from the current account balances, I explain this chart in a minute. If you look at the world from the current account balances, we have to take into account that there are other balances uh, in this world that are closely related to the current account balance and, for example, the government, uh, the government balance, the government deficit or surplus. And we have a simple rule, this is the case of Japan. We have, in this chart I have put down three sectors of each economy, three sectors in each economy, which is private households, which is uh, companies, and which is the government. These are the domestic sectors. And what I show here is the savings rate, so to say, or the, the, the fact whether they are net savers or net debtors. Hmm? Everything above zero is a net saver, so these are sectors that are spending less than they earn. And everything below zero is a net debtor. These are sectors that are spending more than they earn. And this, if you include foreign countries, as is the blue line, sorry, it's in German, foreign countries, the blue line, uh, if you, if you uh, include foreign countries, then you have a representation of the whole world. And for the whole world, we have a simple rule for these four, four curves, for, these, for this chart. The rule is that these four curves always have to add up exactly to zero. Because the world does not have uh, net savings to, to something out there. There is nothing out there. The world cannot get anyone out there to be a net debtor. So for the world, it's always zero. So these curves always have to add up exactly to zero. And then comes a very, a very interesting and challenging observation. Namely, what we see in the Western world, and you see it in Japan in particular, is that traditionally private households are net savers. 
And you see in Japan, even the savings rate, the blue line of private households went down over time. But then something extraordinary happens, namely companies become net savers. Look at the green curve, this is companies, they move above zero in the whole industrialized world. In the whole industrialized world. And for Japan here you see the foreign countries are rather close to zero, which is simply a representation of the fact that Japan cannot go for very high surpluses without earning an appreciation of the yen. Huh? And if the yen appreciates, then Japan is falling back so that it cannot extend uh, uh, the, the current account surplus very much. A surplus is here represented as something below zero because it's a deficit of the rest of the world, so to say, against this country. And here comes a dramatic conclusion. Namely, if the company sector moves above zero, and you're not able, you're not able, this is the important lesson for developing countries, if you're not able to create a current account surplus against the rest of the world, you're in trouble. You're in deep, deep trouble. Because then the normal market relations do not exist anymore. What is the normal market relation? Or the normal market constellation? The normal market constellation, that's the way we have been taught economics for 200 years, is that there is a positive savings rate of private households, but who is the counterpart for the private households? The companies, the company sector, no one else. This is the whole, the whole edifice of economics, we, be it neoclassical, be it Keynesian. They all, they all are absolutely sure that there's always a constellation where private households are the net savers and the companies are the net debtors. And this, what happened in the last 10 years, is absolutely new. These data are difficult to get, but I can only urge you, uh, your statistics, uh, your statistical offices, your statisticians, to try to, to at least to approach, to get, to approximate these data. Because once you're in that situation, the world changes dramatically. Because what, ca what is happening in Japan now, you see? The red line of the government, the government is permanently in deficit. Yeah, because there is no way out. What can the government do? It has to match. It has to match the, the surpluses of the other countries, uh, of, the, of the other sectors. And if the other countries are not doing that, uh, then who's going to do it? It can be only the government. And then let's look at, uh, at the US, for example. You see, in the US, the situation is very simple now. Companies are net savers, private households are net savers, and the rest of the world is a net saver for the US. So who's going to, to run the deficit? Who is going to accumulate debt in the United States in the next years? It's very simple. Only the government, no one else but the government. But this is dramatic, you see? This is absolutely dramatic because government debt is a taboo. We have made the same people who brought the company sector into the net saver condition are the same people who are saying government deficits are have to be avoided by any means. Government deficit is taboo. And you see what I'm talking about, this is not theory, this is not economic theory, this is accounting, this is uh, macroeconomic accounting, this is pure logic, has nothing to do with theory. But this whole approach that we had in the last 30 years with the permanent pressure on wages, with cutting taxes for companies all the time, has produced a very nice situation for the company sector, namely the company sector became a net savers, but it has, yeah, it has run our economies into a deadlock, a situation that we cannot overcome. And this has dramatic consequences for the developing countries. Why does it have dramatic consequences for developing countries? Well, because the whole industrialized world under this situation will try to create current account surpluses and this means current account deficits for the developing world. Because it is the only way out. If you're not allowed by political taboo to increase the government deficit, uh, and if you have that situation, the only way, look at Trump, look at Trump, is to ask the rest of the world to run a deficit. And you know, uh, let's have a look at uh, 
The most important, the most interesting country is Germany. Let's go back. This is Germany, you see. And Germany has found, so to say, in inverted commas, the solution. Namely, Germany, everybody's a saver. The government is a saver, a net saver. The companies are net saver. The private households are net saver. Everybody's a net saver, but there must be a debtor, unfortunately. And who's the debtor? All the other, other guys out there, all the other ones. Greece. Not Germany, but all Greece, yeah, all the others. Yeah. All the others have to be debtors, and forever, you know, because this cannot change. We have put a debt break into our constitution that says the government is never allowed again to go for, for a deficit. At the same time, we are, we are, we are nursing, we are pampering our, our company sector, and we are talking again about cutting taxes for them. So what are they going to do? They ha anyway have too much money. They're not investing enough. The investment is very low. So, but they, they have uh, obviously a surplus uh, in, their, in their return and in their, in their cash, cash flow. So what are we going to do? You see, there's no way out. There's no way out. And this gives the most important, important lesson for developing countries. You see, there's a wonderful idea. The only idea out there that we have in the core of economics about development is, yeah, it's neoclassical growth theory. What does neoclassical growth theory tell you? Well, it's very primitive. It says you need savings. Only if you have savings, then you get investment. And this is the only way to, to develop. You need savings, investment, and then you develop because that creates income. But how do you get savings is there, if there's no net savings in the overall economy? There are no net savings. Who's the net? There's no net saving. Except you have run, as Germany, a current account surplus. But not all the countries in the world can run a current account surplus. That's logical because, well, the world, the current account surplus of the world is zero. Always exactly zero. And that means, what is, what, is, what is the idea about savings? Well, the idea about savings is wrong. It's fundamentally wrong. Because savings are always have a counterpart, and the counterpart is debt. If you increase your savings by whatever means, some people even say in developing countries make the, make the rich people richer because then they save more. Yeah, but who is going to to take on the debt that you need to counter the savings? This is the crucial question, not the savings as such. Savings as such, as such are nothing. Savings as such are, well, really a stumbling block to growth and development. Savings as such are not supporting development, but they are stopping development. But how do you get, how can you invest without savings? Well, and there's one simple way out that is not discussed in traditional economics at all. Namely, that's the way that <coughs> was described by Joseph Schumpeter. And what did Schumpeter, you may know the, the have heard about the theory of economic development of Schumpeter. It's back more than 100 years, 110 years or so it was written. And in my view, it's the only valid, valid theory of development that we have still. And this theory says something very simple. It says forget about savings, you don't need savings. It says capital is created in the process of development. In the process of development, capital is created. It's not there, it's not falling from, from heaven, it's not uh, exogenous. You do not have to import it from developed countries, not at all. Don't do it. No, what you need is a process that produces investment. And where does the money come that this investment is financed by? What is, where is the money coming from? And you see, Schumpeter's answer is very simple, and it's the only reasonable answer that we have. That is, this money is created by central banks. That is the money that finances the investment that produces income and produces savings. 
So the nexus is just the other way around than you traditionally learn. You learn you need savings and then you, you get investment. No, it's the other way around. You finance investment artificially by money coming from nothing, out of nothing, and that creates then income and savings in the, in the second and third round. And this is extremely important. And this is shown by, by this simple chart. Germany creates a lot of savings, but the savings mean nothing. Germany needed a mechanism, and this mechanism was beggaring their neighbors to get them to become indebted, to be the net debtor. And if you look back, there was once a time when Germany was a normal economy. This is Germany in the 60s. And in the 60s, Germany was a normal economy. Why? Because there was no net debt uh, with foreign countries and not with the government. The government was not out of, out, of the, out of the game, more or less, in the 60s. Because the company sector assumed its role of being the net debtor. And why did the company sector do that? And here we come back to what I said at the beginning. Well, because the company sector was eager to invest and to take on debt to invest more, because, why? Because wages were rising all the time. Because we did not have pressure on wages, we did not have pressure on overall demand, but we had a normal, well normal, not accelerated, but a normal wage increase of seven, six, six, seven percent in real terms every year, every year in Germany, that pushed the, uh, the, the company sector to invest because they anticipated, oh, this would go on and on. And now look at Asia. And compare Asia with the other, with the other developing regions. And you see one big difference is in Asia compared to the other developing regions. In all the countries that were successful in Asia in their, in their periods of success, I don't talk about Japan the last 25 years, but Japan 50 years ago, Korea uh, some 30, 40 years ago, Korea still is successful.